This is Goth 9, published June 6th, 2021. A few weeks have passed at the Goth estate. Larry has more or less moved in. The fact of the matter being that he was more or less homeless prior. He'd been living out of his car, using the occasional campsite when his business took him out of the five boroughs. He'd become accustomed to the quiet that such a life created. His life had become habit. Thought still marred by jealousy of the place of privilege enjoyed by the Marscapone clan. Sure, his alumni status meant he was able, permitted, to dine at their leisure from time to time, pop in for a cookie and a spot of tea under the guise of a book request. He'd hoped his loyalty might someday win him a place near the crone's chair. Many of her other students left the city after graduation. But... Kevin's miraculous return to health, not to mention, of course, the elder's untimely death, had thrown a serious wrench into his delusions of grandeur. Kevin and Larry were of similar age, but much else about the young Mars Capone had remained shrouded in mystery. Poor health had confined the young boy to his bedroom. The students of the Magic Academy had only scant rumor to speak of the sickly heir, much drowned in the unspoken hope of his eventual demise. One such rumor was that he had been conceived in the ancient way. That is to say, they had not employed the services of a catalyst. How this was possible, the gossipers had always wondered. Either the crone was much older than she claimed, or her chosen consort was very aged indeed. But... None had ever seen the headmistress tease the existence of a romance. She was, or seemed to be, entirely solitary, sworn to celibacy. And so, in the absence of proof, save the obvious existence of the young boy Kevin, the rumors floated on the wind as unsolved mysteries. The elder Myrtle Marscapone opened his bedroom door a few times a day to bring him a tray heaping with food, sometimes a new library book. Larry's enduring memory, that of the boy's small salutation. Hello, mother. At the old Goth estate. The young heiress, Cassandra Goth, rolls about in bed sunrise nagging her through the blinds, trickling through the curtains. She had heeded the serious advice of Kevin and quit her job at Futuresome, but she hadn't yet become accustomed to waking each morning with an empty docket. It was very much true that she'd been treated much the underling at the laboratory, always the chosen sucker for the odd errand or coffee run. That she wouldn't miss. But the scars of the manacle still hung heavily, staining her skin, always taut, the recollection of bondage never far from her forethought. Finally, she decides to leave the security of her fluffy, faux-down comforter. She straightens the blankets messily. Her father had always preached the gospel of a daily-made bed. In the mirror is a black-haired woman awash in the bounty of her mid-twenties. Or was she still able to claim mid? Numbers laws had always sat just outside her effortless facility. A subpar SAT score would haunt her long after her apprenticeship at the lab had concluded. Cassandra, now acceptably composed, opens the double door of the master suite. Collapsed over the table sits a sleeping Larry Potter his unkempt hair just whispering to the crystal balls set in the table's center. Cassandra gasps, raising her hands to her mouth. Larry! My goodness, are you okay? She approaches him, fear filling her senses, afraid of the worst. She places her hands gently over his shoulders, desperately hoping to rouse him from slumber. Larry emits a few soft groans, uncomfortable in the sleeping position that had been pressed upon him. For a moment, he's unaware of where he's been laid. Larry, 
Oh, my lord. You fell asleep at the table. Are you okay? He stretches, blinks, his eyes crusty with dust. Yeah. I, I guess I'm okay. His back aches. He stands and tries to return it to life. He pushes in the chair in which he'd fainted. You're working too hard, Larry. Really. I haven't seen any of those creepy dolls in at least a week. Probably more. Longer. I don't want to come out here and find you collapsed like that. It really worries me. Yeah. I'm, I'm sorry about that, Cassie. I was just... I don't know. Couldn't sleep. Well... I guess I did eventually sleep. I just, I was just, I thought I was making progress. You are making progress. Please don't wear yourself so thin. Huh. <laughs> no worries there. Larry chooses the path of a self-deprecating joke. His lifestyle had afforded few trips to the gym and the corners of his metallic steed had become peppered with junk food wrappers. Larry manages a smile, weakly. He is glad that it was Cassandra who found him, and not Lucia. He looks over his shoulder toward her room. The door is closed and quiet. What time is it anyway? A few minutes to seven? Larry continues to stretch. He'd come to find comfort in his car's back seat. But that rickety chair was not a familiar pose for him. Let me cook you some breakfast. <sighs> that is, unless you prefer to go back to sleep. I can't imagine you got great rest hunched over the table. The suggestion implies a return to his assigned room. Oh no, I'm... I'm awake now. I'd love some breakfast. A smile breaks upon Cassandra's face. It was always more fun to cook for two. Great! Boiled eggs and toast? Sounds great. Soft or hard? Boiled, that is. Soft, soft. I hate it when the insides of the egg turn all gray-like. Oh yeah, that means they're overdone. It's hard to know. Just want to take them out. They chuckle lightly, in time. The pause sees them just catch each other's gaze. Words fall from the tools available to them. Downstairs, then. They track down the staircase. Each is aware that they prepare to dine in the absence of the witch of the house. But she kept her own schedule, appearing at unpredictable times and for awkward durations. Larry feels a guilt from an unknown source and tries to follow her into the kitchen, but she refuses him entrance. Sit, sit. You're the one who fell asleep in a chair. Larry cannot debate the point. He sits at the nearby dining table. Fine, fine. Can do. Cassandra removes a carton of eggs from the fridge. The loaf of bread is retrieved from its rest upon the top of the icebox. The rubber feet of the toaster squeak against the stress of Cassandra pulling it from its sleep adjacent to the tile molding. The counter is just sprinkled with breadcrumb detritus. Thanks for cooking for me, Cassie. Oh, it's no thing. I like it. Really. 
She removes a medium-sized pot from a lazy Susan. She turns to the sink, and the sloshing of tap water necessitates a moment of silence. But soon, it is over. And the gas range whistles to life. Cassandra sets the water to heat. The emission of gas forms a sort of white noise of ambiance in the background. Cassandra stares at the pot for a little while. So, uh, how's the exorcism going elsewise? You, uh, you haven't seen Temperance again, have you? Larry becomes anxious at the mention of the name. Oh, you, you shouldn't ask such things. Under the assumption that we do see her again, she'll be able to smell the gossip we conducted in her name. Smell? Ghosts can smell? Sure can. Although, it's not exactly smelling as we do. It's a psychic feeling that is like smelling and like hearing. But I guess it's like feeling too. The way you can feel the waves lapping against your legs at the beach. Okay, so no gossip. Nope. You got it. But I do feel I'm making general progress on your case. It's a trying one for sure. Your grandmother was deeply connected to this location. You know, I had this delusion once or twice. <sighs> no, no. I don't want you to think I'm a loony. I am a worker in the paranatural, remember? Yeah, I guess. Well, here goes. What if the house were sentient? Could the house itself be a single sentient entity capable of thought and feeling? I just, well, you know... A bacterium is such a thing. Not capable of thought so much, I think, but it is an entity. And a bacterium can inhabit a human body. And a human body is capable of all these things. Thought, feeling, experience, you know. But a bacterium would have no way to fully comprehend the body of the human in which it lives. So by that idea, could not a human being living in a house be like a bacterium who's taken up residence inside a human being? That doesn't sound crazy at all to me. It's actually quite reasonable in my line of work. Spirits often find themselves bound to an object. A place, a house, even. Just as you and I are souls bound to these corporeal meat bags. At least that is our current state. Someday that will change. <sighs> and when we do see ghosts, they are often taking their shadow form, so as to make it easier for us people to recognize them, but they don't rest like that, think like that. Cassandra removes pre-sliced bread from a porous plastic sleeve and slips it into the aforementioned toaster. It disappears with a distinct swing. The toaster buzzes just audibly, heating its inner coils. Cassandra turns and revisits the refrigerator, removing a tub of spreading butter. She walks over to the dining table and places it, inoffensively, 
within his reach. It's, it's hard to imagine with all our dramas and dreams that we could be regarded as no more complex than microorganisms. Thankfully, the souls of the dead tend to have pity and interest in us, having themselves once occupied the prime material plane. But they could always change their minds. I, I take antibiotics when I feel unwell. It's true. Though, I try not to. It wipes out good bacteria as much as it does bad. So you have to really need the flush. You're speaking of the higher order spirits. I can't say I have much sway with them. It's hard to, to get an intelligible exchange of ideas. Not just is the language and timekeepers an issue, but matters of scale. Like trying to talk to your CPU using a rotary phone? The conversation hangs. It's clear Larry has missed understanding. Uh... CPU? Yeah. You know, uh, inside, inside a computer is a CPU. It's like, uh, like the brain of the computer. Central processing unit or some such. It performs all the computations required for a computer to do what it does. You want to look at a picture of a kitty cat, it tells your monitor which pixels to change in order to render the desired data file. I... Uh, see. It's inseparable from RAM, though. Random access memory. Basically, how much stuff the computer can handle in its working thought. You know, uh, can you pat your head and rub your stomach at the same time? That whole choke test they used to give you in elementary school. Can you pat your head and rub your tummy at the same time? Try it. Larry tries. He places his right hand upon his head and his left just in front of the hoodie's pocket. It's a success. Okay, now, super challenge. Can you still do it if you switch your hands? Left to right? Yeah, you're right-handed, right? <laughs> yeah. Switch them and see if you still can. He can't. Oh, it's not a big deal. You can always practice if you really want to be able to do the task. Larry looks at his hands in disappointment. You know what other silly test I've heard of? Larry's silent. But if you can tie a knot in a cherry stem, you're supposedly a good kisser. Y you know, with your tongue. It's a bar trick. Or at least some trick you'd try to show off while at the bar. I'm not even so sure it's even possible, though. I've tried a few times, and it hasn't even been close. I'd hate to think such a disability would confine me to the world of bad kissers. <laughs> you ever heard of that one? Larry has been shifting about uncomfortably. He jumps in his seat when... Fist! The toast springs forth from the slots. No, uh... Haven't heard of that one. She flips the heated bread upon a plate with haste. It's hot. Your toast. Eh, I suppose I haven't cooked. I shouldn't have, you know, cooked it so soon. We've still got time on the eggs. It's, it's fine. Cassandra leaves the table. The water is just threatening to boil. Two or three. 
three. All right, I'll take three myself. I'm hungry this morning. Plunk, plunk, plunk. Six eggs fill the sauce pot, seeming small. The water ceases its boil. It will have to equilibrate. Cassandra comes to the table and sits in a seat 90 degrees from Larry. He seems disquieted. You, uh, want to butter your toast? This is the real stuff. It'll melt best if you... Yeah, sure. Cassandra gets up from the table to fetch him a butter knife. It is broad and just barely aquiline. Larry takes it from her hand and spreads butter over the wheat toast. It melts almost immediately, becoming translucent. Larry takes one bite instinctually, but regrets his decision, and leaves the rest to be consumed with the eggs. You said the spirits bind themselves to objects in order to exist in this sphere? They do. You and I are possessed right now, our souls feeding upon the experiences facilitated by our bodies. But not the house as a whole. Now, I didn't say that. Just that it would be difficult to commune or speak with her. Yeah, I always think it's a her, too. Oh, well, I... I I don't know for certain. It was just a turn of phrase. Turn of phrase? Uh, you know, an idiomatic expression. So it could be a girl or a boy. I, uh... Spirits able to possess an object is storied and complex as an entire house may be beyond such notions as sexual dimorphism. Oh. I suppose that might be true. They would have little need for such distinctions since they are sourced from our realm. Huh. I guess. But I thought maybe we were sourced from theirs, perhaps. It, uh, may depend on the spirit themselves. But really, I wouldn't trouble yourself with these minor details. It's key we stay focused on the here and now, the present. That is the only way we can ever hope to get your home's unrest settled. I'm sorry. I do have a tendency to overthink things. The table sits in silence for a few moments. Cassandra is using the digital clock on the oven to time her eggs. Neither of them can easily tolerate the broken conversation. So... What do you know about vampires? Larry raises his gaze from his plate, and his uneasy expression startles her. Shit! I didn't offer you anything to drink. Coffee? Larry feels his head is leaden. He takes a moment to reply. Yeah, some coffee would be great. Cassandra is finally able to leave the table, and she does so gladly. She has purchased a machine that makes single cups of coffee, and it is one of her favorite kitchen gadgets. French vanilla? Sounds great. Cassandra buzzes about the kitchen. The eggs still need more time. Vampires are undead. 
Their very existence is an affront to God. I... I didn't know you were Christian. It doesn't matter if I believe in the divinity of a man named Jesus Christ, prophet, son, holy man, or other. The undead keep spirits from leaving the plane. They aren't supposed to be here. They possess their bodies beyond their properly allotted date. Like a car parked in a two-hour zone, loaded up with parking tickets that the city can't tow because it belongs to someone famous. And you desperately want that parking space. You've been waiting for it for hours, days, weeks. The souls are bound beyond the law? How can they do that? And... How is that different? The bodies, too, should return to Earth. They are thieves of the highest degree, stealing life force from those that create it without asking. Vagrants. Freeloaders. Yeah, the blood drinking is kind of scary. I'll agree with you there. You should agree with me everywhere. They're monsters. But isn't it possible to cure it? Once a thief, always a thief. The best hope you have is to be a thief in recovery. Sugar? Uh, milk? Always. Thanks. Jealousy can be invigorating. Larry speaks with renewed energy. I'm sure you speak of Kevin Marscapone. A flush spreads across Cassandra's cheeks. You're familiar with that family? Yeah, I am. I just didn't realize you had already made acquaintance with their heir. Oh, please. It's, it's nothing like that. I know he claims himself cured. Cleansed. I guess he spread that false gospel to you too. We were co-workers at my old lab. And when Lucia showed up on my doorstep, she name-dropped Kevin's mother. She would. The crone was a protector, a holy woman. Taught me everything I know. And what tears has the parasite shed since her passage? The world needed the headmistress. She took in every stray she found. She walked in the light. Many of our kind have gone on for hundreds of years. She could have gone on to foster many more if she hadn't been bedraggled by the accursed. The accursed? There's something wrong about him. He now stands as the house's conjurer, but it's an affront to nature, an affront to wizards. He wasn't converted. He wasn't always that way. A born vampire. The fact that some higher order of evil dares to change the propagation method of the curse. Cassandra thinks back to the image presented her by her brother snooping on the internet. A young Kevin. Younger than her own brother then. Pale and sickly. Bearing a mouth of mismatched teeth. Oversized and set askew. If, if he were born that way, it seems unfair to despise. Don't try to tell me what's fair and unfair. His sudden outburst startles Cassandra, and he regrets his tone. <sighs> I'm sorry. It's just... 
I have plenty of personal reasons to hate him as an alum of his mother's school. It just compounds when I consider that while I may pity the child, I have nothing but contempt for the soul, likely a fully formed lantern that chose to infest his body and invade our home realm. You, you think his spirit wasn't created anew? No, I do not. I have reason to suspect that he is host to something, someone, far older and with sinister motive. The accusation refuses to embed itself in Cassandra's belief system. The eyes she'd seen in the photograph, so quiet, sad, lonely. Hate the sin, love the sinner. Cassandra presents Larry with a piping cup of coffee and three eggs in a bowl. Love the... Hate the sin, love the sinner. It probably isn't an official psalm or anything, just something my father taught me. It means you can hate the bad things people do, but it's not your job. It's even cruel and ungodly to hate a person directly. <laughs> if you were in my shoes, watching the matron of my house doting over him, reduced to playing nursemaid as some evil incarnate, Kindness upon kindness heaped upon the hungers of a hell spawn. Only to have that very creature claim he's dispatched with his curse and steal from you any hope of promotion from paper boy. Maybe it's that he's trying to atone for his sins? Larry seems to tense up, losing patience with the discussion. But he tries to disperse the anger. He is, after all, trying to court the goth mistress, ghosts and all. Yeah, I guess you're right. So you went to the Mars Capone School of Magic? Surely did. It wasn't just a school just any old school, though. It was also, uh, what do you call it, a uh, group home. You're an orphan? I am. My parents died in a car crash. Oh, my goodness. That's terrible. I... I'm... I'm sort of an orphan, too. But my parents just passed a few years back. So it's not like I had to... to go to a... a group home? I'm sorry to hear about your parents. As for me, it's okay. I loved my time there. The headmistress was the finest instructor in all America. Maybe even the world, but I can't speak to that on authority. Never left the States myself. But I'd venture to bet. You met the matron, right? I... I did. Cassandra recalls, just seeming a few months prior. Although on recollection, it had to be more than that. The matron Mars Capone had employed ice magics to threaten and interrogate the young Lucia Ekstrom. She fought in the Great War, and then returned home to found our dear old school. Lucia claimed my mother was a witch. Was she trained by? Oh, no. 
I don't really know much about your mother, but she was probably taught by your grandmother. Most magicking families are like that. Our school was special because the headmistress took in orphans, housed us, fed us, taught us. Not everyone has a family, but she felt, feels, if I may be so bold, that we are stronger with nurturing, even those that don't have a magical hearth to return to. She herself never knew her mother. It is unfortunate that she wasn't blessed with a daughter. The use of magic goes down through the matrilineal line. It is more strongly passed by mother to daughter, yes, but it's not strictly required. I, obviously, mark an exception, as does the headmistress son. And me too. My mother didn't pass anything to me. I'm just an ordinary girl in an extraordinary world. You still carry her likeness within you. Who's to say what your daughters and sons may be like? There's still much we don't know about the bloodlines. There are even people who can work the weave who come from no known ancestry. One time, I was talking with Kevin, and he made it sound like there was still a chance for me. A hope. That maybe with some training, maybe I could be like you. It's not impossible. But it is a bit cruel of him to plant that hope within your mind. Most people who are extranatural manifest signs in their childhood. Kevin started late, sure, but his mother is a magus of unusual ken. And he was born a vampire. Larry shudders, uncomfortable with the turn of conversation. Something like it. Some kind of strange half-breed. Does that mean his father? I don't really know. Okay, okay, I'm, I'm sorry. Are vampires a subset of mages? What? It's probably a stupid question. It just seems like you're only asking this because you've only just recently left the mortal fog of ignorance. Offended, Cassandra puts down her utensil. It's not my fault my mother lied to me. And wouldn't you be just as stupid as me if you hadn't been recruited to your fancy little magic academy? Larry joins the list of the offended. Sue me, judge me, all you like for asking a simple question. I think I've been more than accommodating, provided it was not too long ago the only mage I knew of was the Wizard of Fantasia. You've had your entire life where the rest of us have walked around stupidly, a veil drawn over our eyes. The room is stunned into silence, soon interrupted by the sound of Lucia descending the stairs. Oh, Cassie. Has the little wart upset you? Didn't I tell you to play nice with the lady of the house? She walks over to the table. She's even made you breakfast. Larry is simply jealous. It is a mode of his I find, frankly, unbecoming. But it is a common affliction of those who cannot accept their lot. 
Larry dares not speak against Lucia. The young Marscapone was never anything but kind toward me. Where the elder's message was always choked amid needless religiosity and coated with the rhetoric of chains of obedience. She claimed to make her own family, her own house, and by sheer number of devotees, we might even see her as successful. But it remains that not all wizards are good.